Welcome to the Bethel Church Sermon of the Week. We hope you enjoy this message by Pastor Bill Johnson. For more information about this podcast and other resources, visit iBethel.org. Take, a, take your Bibles open to 2 Corinthians <clears throat> chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. In, <clears throat> excuse me, in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul makes this statement about wanting to make sure that the people of God were not ignorant of the devil's devices. Not ignorant of the devil's thoughts, plans, strategies. <clears throat> the devil is an inferior power. He has no authority, but he does have power. He's an inferior power to the believer. But the implication of this verse is, is that the inferior power can have influence over superior power if the superior is ignorant. <clears throat> I never like to do anything that overemphasizes the devil, his plans, his strategies. He doesn't interest me at all. Just when he's in the way, just long enough to pull the trigger. That's all I, that's all I need to know. <clears throat> I had somebody write me yesterday that the Antichrist was coming and I needed to watch for him. <laughs> now there's a depressing invitation right there. And I, I wrote back uh, Psalm 68, let God arise and his enemies be scattered. I think I'm going to watch for God to arise instead of the Antichrist to arise. Anyway, I do believe it's possible to react to the overly devil conscious, the devil chasers, and become devil ignorant. And so I want to talk to you today about warfare. I want to talk to you about what God has assigned to us and how the enemy has successfully impacted an entire nation through a deluge of deception. The worst reaction possible today, as I will be dealing with a few political issues, the worst possible reaction would be to stir up a political spirit. A political spirit wars according to the flesh, and it fights flesh. The devil doesn't mind what side of an issue you're on as long as you fight with carnal means to destroy other people. He doesn't care what side of any issue you're on, even pro-abortion, against abortion. If if he can get you you, to use natural means to destroy other people, then he has succeeded. He warns us about the nature of spiritual warfare, what we war against, what the real issues are. And so in this passage, uh, we should probably just get reading. It's in 2 Corinthians 10. We will start with verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh... We do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments in every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ, and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. I personally believe... Uh, Verse 6 is the heart of the Lord concerning his return to earth as well, that um, he's waiting for full obedience to be complete. Go back to verse 3. Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. In the New American Standard Translation, I believe it's called fortresses. It's the same basic word that we find throughout Scripture um, as it pertains to Um, as it pertains to the subject of strongholds, is another word for it is a castle. If you could imagine the enemy living in a castle in reinforced security that we create for him by how we think. The demonic exists in a safe realm in the thoughts of unbelieving people, whether they're believers or not. Picture this. I'm going to read the other side of the coin. The Lord is my rock and my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield, the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Psalm 31, you are my rock, my fortress. For your namesake, you will lead me and guide me. 
Psalm 71, be to me a rock of habitation to which I may continually come. You have given me commandment to save me. You are my rock and my fortress. Psalms 91, I will say to the Lord, my refuge, my fortress, my God in whom I trust. This whole concept of a fortress, a place of safety, is, if you picture this, a place of safety where you rest, you're reignited, re vitalized, you are fed, you are safe. It's a beautiful picture when we talk about God being our stronghold, when we talk about God being our resting place. The Bible says His name is a strong power, a strong tower, a place of habitation for us where we stand in the name of the Lord and we are safe, we are secure, we are fed, nourished, strengthened, protected, etc. Now, the dark side. In evil thoughts, we create that for the demonic. The devil doesn't, it's not, he's not saying the devil exists in your imagination. In other words, he's not really there, but if you imagine him, he's there. It's not that. It's he actually feeds from the thought realm. The reason for taking thoughts captive, the re- reason for the renewed mind is to break the contract, break the agreement that humanity has made with powers of darkness. The devil has no authority, but he does have power. The way he gets authority is to talk until he can get someone to agree. When he gets one person that God has given authority to, to come into agreement, to consider his ideals, his thoughts, his ambitions, plans, strategies, etc., when there's agreement, he usurps and steals that authority and operates out of counterfeit authority. So Paul is dealing with something here <clears throat> that pertains to not only an individual life, but actually communities, states, regions, and nations that come under the influence of certain ways of thinking. I don't understand how this works completely. I'm, uh, let me just kind of try to talk my way through it. I don't know how this works, but somehow the thought life of an individual fuels the invisible realm. We, we actually create alliances by what we think. Light and dark, good and bad. We actually create alliances. <clears throat> Jesus had, had a little powwow with the disciples and he told them, he says, I'm, I'm going to be dying soon. And Peter saw his power position slipping through his hands and had this brainstorm of an idea to rebuke God. So he took Jesus aside and rebuked him, corrected him for that whole plan of wanting to die. And Peter saw, the excuse me, Jesus was looking at Peter, and he saw the disciples gathering, and he knew that the spirit of stupid was contagious. <laughs> so he knew he better act quickly, because they'll catch on and be as dumb as Peter is. And the Bible says, he looks at Peter and he says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Talks to Peter. Now, Peter had just gotten one of the greatest revelations ever in all of Scripture. And he went from the mountaintop to the deepest valley in moments of time. He crashed and burned really bad. Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. And listen to why he explains that, why he says that. Get Get behind me, Satan, for your mind is not filled with the things of God. Your mind is filled with the things of man. Now please notice, he didn't say, your mind is filled with occultic things. Your mind is, get behind me Satan, your mind is filled with devil worship. He didn't need to do that. Your mind is filled with the things of man. Anytime you have man, humanity, without Christ at the center, you have a violation of design. And when you have a violation of design, you have perversion. Humanity without Christ at the center is demonic in nature. Get behind me, Satan, because your mind is filled with the things of man, not filled with the things of God. So what's the picture? The picture is is the demonic realm was actually attracted to the thought processes that Peter had used. 
it would probably be safe to to imply that the fiery darts of the enemy helped Peter to pick up wrong ideas on what the kingdom of God was supposed to be like, what his responsibility was. But regardless of how it happened, Peter's thought life became uh, was in harmony with the demonic realm, and somehow the thought life actually can create a place of safety from which the demonic works from. <clears throat> If you could picture, uh, like, uh, uh, let's say a castle built out of stone. When we have unchecked, unguarded, unrepented thoughts that are wrong, they build the wall to the castle. And if you can imagine a lifetime, a lifestyle of illegitimate consideration of your self-image, illegitimate consideration of God's goodness, illegitimate consideration of His design for your life, whatever it might be. Stone after stone is built until there's finally a place of safety for the enemy to reside in and to work from, to launch his assaults from. Repentance must be deep to unravel that which the enemy has attached himself to. In the same way that the demonic is attracted to evil thought patterns. Everybody has to deal with evil thought. I mean, we we live in a place where there's this constant airways, good and bad. Darts flying this way and that way. It's what you do with, with what comes. And the meditation, the contemplation, the dwelling, the embracing of evil thought, evil idea, without it going unchecked, actually attracts the demonic. Now, flip the coin. Thoughts about God, consideration of His promises, His purposes. What Mary did, what Mary, the mother of Jesus, did, when she kept hearing these prophecies about her son Jesus, it says, and she pondered these things in her heart. What happened? When you ponder the the purposes of God, the design of God, the consideration of God, the Word of God, the promise of God over your life, you attract the angelic realm to enforce and to help you carry out the purposes of God. Your thought life actually becomes uh, uh, an avenue of partnership with the unseen realm for you to fulfill your purpose and destiny. I don't know how it works, but I just know that it does. Flies are attracted to decay. There's a scent that decay gives off. And stinking thinking gives off a fragrance that attract. And Paul conversely says that you and I are the fragrance of Christ. The mind of Christ enables us to release the actual scent of the throne room of the Almighty God to attract the angelic beings into our lives to help us carry out a purpose. I read something I, I wrote down here a couple of weeks ago, or when I was, I was here last, I think it was three weeks ago. <clears throat> it says, when we, knew, when we lose the knowledge of the existence of a creator, we lose the concept of design. When we lose the concept of design, we undermine the discovery of purpose. When we undermine the discovery of purpose, we remove the conviction for accountability. When we remove the conviction of accountability, we undermine the fear of God. The Bible says the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. The enemy has worked hard to have a generation that questions the existence of a creator. Why? Because if he can attack the concept of creator, he can begin to disintegrate the concept of design. And design is what reveals purpose. All sin is a violation of design. All sin is a violation of design. Sex outside of marriage is a violation of design. God ordained one man to be married to one woman and to celebrate the fact that they resist opportunities outside of their covenant and it gives greater pleasure for them to celebrate the privilege of union in the covenant. Those who think they can live immorally any way they want with whoever they want and the grace of God will cover them, you've got a surprise coming. 
Any neighborhood dog can live that way. That just felt good to say. I must, I must admit, a certain amount of pleasure. It's a violation of design because God designed us, one man, one woman, to make covenant and in covenant celebrate the privilege of union. Anything outside of that is a perversion. It's a destruction of design. Homosexuality, it's a no-brainer. It wasn't designed that way. You weren't designed, God did not design anyone that way. It's a violation of design. Greed, if I want what you own, it's a violation of design. Why? Because God made me to be a contributor to society through servanthood, through love for people, through creativity and my commitment to excellence to contribute to the well-being of people around you. What does that do? It creates a system whereby I live in the reward of a Heavenly Father. He rewards me with favor. He rewards me with peace. He rewards me with meaningful relationships. He rewards me with prosperity. And when I want your stuff, I remove myself from the reward system to the system of the thief. And even though I don't steal what you have, I have removed myself from the concept of reward, and now I'm going to take charge of my life to make sure I get what's coming to me. Years ago, I was, I was uh, buying some gum at a store, and they charged me whatever. They charged me a dime, I think it was. And I was in the store the next day, and I noticed the gum they, they charged me a dime for was 25 cents. So I, I waited in line, finally got up to the lady, and I said, um, I, said I, I bought gum here yesterday, and, and, uh, and, I, and they didn't know how much it was, and they charged me a dime, and, or no, they charged me 15 cents, and I just noticed it's actually 25 cents. So I, I owe you a dime. She didn't know what to do, so she called the manager. <laughs> I, I thought it would be relatively simple, just put the dime in a little tray there. And she called the manager. The manager says, oh, what's the problem? I said, well, there really isn't a problem. I just wasn't charged enough for gum yesterday. And so I, 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 have, uh, I have a dime here for you. And he says, if you want, you can keep it. He said, you're only the second person I, in all the years I've worked here that, that I've seen do this. As he said, you're welcome to keep it. I said, I'd, if you don't mind, I'd rather not. Because if I make sure you get what you deserve, God will make sure I get what I deserve. There's the exchange. I was in a restaurant in San Francisco at the airport where I spent a good part of my life. And I was sitting down and I noticed a couple walked in and, and there were some dollar bills wrapped up, a tip. I don't know what they were, fives or tens or whatever, but they were wrapped up together. They had fallen off the table. They were the tip money. And they had fallen off the table. And the lady went down, picked it up, and she just very sneakily handed it to her husband. He put it in his pocket. And so Benny and I are sitting there having lunch, and I kept waiting for them to do something noble. They didn't. So I went over to them, and I said, Hey, um, you might want to put the tip money that actually belongs to that waitress back on the table and let her know what you found. She'll be very, very happy. And they went, Oh, yeah, 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 of, of course, of course, of course. When, when you want other people's stuff, you misinterpret the moments you have in life, and you actually, any sin can be justified by dulling down what the Bible says. It's possible. We have people out there that are condoning anything and everything you can believe of by misusing Scripture. The Pharisees did it. Jesus warned them in, in Mark 7. He says, he says, you have stripped the Word of God of its power through your tradition. Now, how big of a statement is that? It's huge because God spoke the worlds into being. The Word is the most powerful creative force in the universe. And here Jesus looks at religious leaders and he says, you have stripped or unplugged the power source of the most powerful thing in the universe through your traditions. It is possible for a person to violate the purposes of God as it pertains to their role in carrying out the purposes of God and actually dull down and justify and make sin okay. Grace does not cover intentional sin. It empowers righteousness. 
It does not give permission to do as we want. It gives us permission to live according to design. Amen. Bill. Amen. That's a very good point. I don't understand how this works. But somehow, the demonic realm, I'm going to assume angelic, I don't know, but the demonic realm actually has to pay attention to geographical boundaries and borders. <clears throat> when Jesus delivered the man of the Gadarenes, the man who, when the demons left him, uh, went and filled 2,000 pigs, <laughs> creating deviled ham, It's, it's never been any better than that right there. It's always just taking a nosedive. But the whole economy went belly up as, as they went. Yeah. All right. These 2,000 pigs go into the water and drown. That is divine humor because the Bible says the demonic realm, when they are cast out of a place, look for waterless places. I, I don't know if you got it. He sent them into the pigs. The pigs went and drowned. Why do they look for water in those places? I have no idea. All I know is they don't like water. Oh, come on. That's a divine joke right there. But before Jesus cast the demons out, listen to this. The man of the Gadarenes is there before Jesus. The demons speak out of him and beg, please don't send us out of the territory. Why? There's geographical assignment and responsibility. Interestingly, there's a Latin American country, and I, I, I don't know which one it is. There's a highway that borders these two countries. And on one side of the highway is one nation, on the other side of the highway is another. One nation is very open to the things of God. There's a great move of God there. The people are hungry. There's wonderful things going on. In the neighboring nation, there's great resistance and hostility towards the gospel. Those who have gone down that street minister on one side, there's great openness to the gospel. On the other side of the street, maybe 50 yards away, their neighbors are hostile and opposing the gospel message that is brought to that side of the street. And yet they only live that far apart. Why? I don't know, but somehow decisions made by governmental leaders affect what has permission to influence the thought life of its citizens. You have to catch that. When leaders make covenants with the demonic realm, it releases something over a city, over a state, and over a nation. Now, this is the part that I, I, I want to be careful with, not so much what I say as much as your reaction to what I say. Because the last thing in the world we need is people to fight according to the weapons of the flesh. And I'll, I'll give you very specific things that the Lord has assigned us to do. <clears throat> when the Supreme Court said that marriage could be between a man and a man, a woman and a woman, something was released over the nation that the church wasn't ready for. And many believers, unsuspecting believers, have come under the deception of, well, it's got to be okay. God made them that way. Tragically, one of the great ministries in the nation to help people get free from that particular sin after the decision was made came under that influence and closed its doors and they themselves went back into homosexuality. I don't care what the sin is. When leaders of a nation make decisions, they actually make agreements with an unseen realm. And they empower them and fuel them and nourish them with permission according to the authority that they've been given. Not all is hopeless. We have a responsibility, and that's what I want to outline for you. It is to fight not according to the flesh, not according to the carnal men, but according to the mandate that God has given us. All right? In this responsibility with borders and boundaries... 
God has made it so that culture is actually defined by political leaders, um, uh, business leaders, um, athletes, uh, people in uh, entertainment industry. Culture is shaped from the top down. But moves of God start from the bottom up. They start with the poor. It may not be the poorest of the poor economically, but it's always going to be with the poor in spirit. Those who are in desperate hunger for God to touch and change their lives. Something happens on a grassroots level. If you could picture this as a fire, when the fires of revival start at a grassroots level, if it goes on long enough, and I believe strategic enough, it will burn its way up to influence those who are the mind molders of culture and society. When the revival fails to reach those who shape culture, then you only have a revival that is short-lived and has brought inspiration and strength to the church, but you've never, you've never changed culture. You don't have what history would call a reformation. Are, are you with me? And so a move of God is supposed to continue uh, be sustained by people who offer themselves as a continual living offering so that the fire of God continues to fall and work among us, working the miracles and change and transform lives until finally it works its way into the lives of the mind molders, those who shape culture. Right now we have, we have a wonderful move of God, but it has not touched the politically elite. Now I can say on a side note without giving any names because I'm forbidden to, there are politically elite people that you would never guess in a million years that are being rocked right now by the Lord. People that you would not expect that are having encounters with the Lord. And we rejoice in this. But what sustains this particular strategy is that you and I take on ourselves a 25 to 30 year commitment that says we are in this for the long haul to help raise up a generation that knows how to think for themselves, that knows how to articulate truth. Truth is never at the mercy of a lie. Revelation is never at the mercy of deception. There's something about truth spoken in love to people. The angelic realm is attracted into the environment to enforce and to validate that which has been declared. It's not an issue of debate. It's not an issue of accusation. That's that political spirit. That's that religious spirit that wants to accuse and condemn and mock and, and, you know, you're wrong and I'm right. No, it's not an us and them thing. It's a us thing. And we need help. And what the compassion of the Lord does is it enables us to speak the truth in love to bring people out of situations that's killing them. It's a violation of design. And, and, and our, our great privilege in life is to help restore people to the design of the Lord for their life. It's in every area of life. It's in thought life. It's in our emotions. It's in our family life. It's in business. It's in community. It's on all the things that you've heard already even announced this morning. It's the privilege of being together and celebrating life so that we, we introduce others to the freedom that Christ gives. It's not the freedom of Bethel Church. It's not the freedom of, of, you know, some Christian club. It's the fact that God himself sets people free. And you and I have this privilege through thinking the thoughts of God, the possibilities, the potentials, the promises, the revelation, the things that God has promised for every person in this room. To dwell on those things literally invites the angelic realm into a place of partnership to enforce and to enable us to carry out the purposes of God. It's amazing. It's a partnership between you and God. You and God is a majority. This says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. How do we pull down strongholds or fortresses? Places where the demonic has a safe hiding place. Your goal in life should be to make every demon homeless. <laughs> homeless demons. Pulling down strongholds. Pulling down castles of habitation. How? By casting down arguments and every high thing, lofty thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. That seems to imply that the thought itself has a personality to it. There's a spiritual power attached to it that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to Christ. All right, here's the deal. 
I believe the Lord assigns his people to live in the mind of Christ. Now, every one of us, the battle is in the mind, whether it's self-doubt, whether it's, it's uh, you know, other issues of temptation, whatever that come up. The battleground is the mind. The Lord is bringing us into a relationship with him where we know how to respond to the stuff that's thrown our way what to do with the illegal or the thoughts that violate the purposes of God, how to put them quickly under our feet, how to take those thoughts captive to the uh, uh, obedience of Christ, to take that, no, that's not who I am. That accusation right there, that's not me. I bring it to the obedience of Christ. I've been made new in Christ. The grace of God covers my past, whatever it might be. And we, and we, we learn what to do, and we replace the wrong thought with the kingdom thought. You bind and loose. You bind what's wrong, you loose what's right. And so here we are. The Lord is showing us to do this. Why? Because the person who gains control over their own thought life is positioned to influence the thought life of a city. But listen to me. Not just a city, but an entire nation. You remember the passage out of Philippians, Philippians 4 where Paul tells the uh, church at Philippi the kinds of things they should be thinking of. Think on these things, whatever is honorable, whatever is of good report, anything that is true, anything that is lovely, any, anything that is beholding. Those things, fill your heart and mind with those things. Why? Because uh, kingdom thoughts breed kingdom revelation. That's the truth. But listen to this. This is the strategy of the Lord for every one of us. Therefore, I exhort, first of all, top priority, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. For kings, all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence, I believe that the Lord is positioning the believer in this hour with, first of all, an awareness of the tactics of the enemy, how the enemy has plotted to poison the minds of people. When the Supreme Court made the decision they made, a power was released over the nation that has affected the, the minds of believer and non-believer alike. When there's an influence over an area, I don't care if it's the neighborhood you live in, maybe it's a violent neighborhood, maybe there's a lot of drug dealing going on, could be any, any number of things. When there's a prevailing atmosphere in your neighborhood, if you don't war against it, it will affect you. There has to be intentional purpose to live opposite of that prevailing spirit. Does that make sense? Intentionality. I embrace the purposes of God for my heart, for my life, I will not entertain or consider things that are in violation with what God says in His Word. That agreement and alignment positions me to have influence on the airwaves. This scripture says to take every thought captive. I believe the desire of the Lord is, is for us to be a First Timothy 2 people that pray for leaders. Why? Because when you pray for leaders, you influence how they influence culture. And when you influence what, uh, it's, it's almost like, it's almost like a radio that gets bad signals and good signals. And when you pray a protection over those that God has placed as leaders over your life, Governors, kings, senators, congressmen, whatever it might be. Some of you from other countries, parliament leaders, uh, various things, kings, queens, whatever. When you pray for those who are in leadership, you actually have influence on pulling out the negative atmosphere that keeps them in a place of delusion, in a place of deception. 
It's not appropriate for us to use anointing and power to manipulate what they think. That's a misuse of authority. But we can pray that God would put over them a safety over their thought life, a safety around them so that they have godly counsel. We are not to use fleshly tools to get our way and manipulate our way to the top for influence. I I don't buy that. And many Christians are using uh, manipulation and calling it you know, the power of the voter. Some, I believe in voting. I believe in all that. I'm opening a can of worms, but we'll just leave it open. You can go fishing, I guess. <clears throat> what God's called us to is a people that learn how to do true warfare, and that's on our knees. It's not belly aching to God. If you come out of an intense prayer time, more depressed than when you went in, you weren't interceding. You were complaining. He says, come to me, you who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you a rest. In other words, come to me with your junk and I'll give you my stuff. My stuff's good, your stuff's bad. We'll make an exchange. So here he says, pray for all these in authority. Why? Because I want you to live a peaceable life in all godliness, reverence. Now listen to the result. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved. What is that saying? By you praying for leaders, by us together saying, we will pray and we will will take charge of the airwaves over that atmosphere that influences their options. We will serve them so that they see God's purposes, that they don't live outside uh, of God's design. They don't violate the design of the Lord for their, for their life, the purpose of their life, that they would see divine purpose and destiny, that those things would become clear, that we pray lovingly and supportively for these leaders, regardless of what side of the aisle they are politically, that we pray in a supportive, loving manner for them, not against them. Then we help to influence the airways from which they get their information. And the end result was, this is pleasing to God, who desires all men to be saved. What is he saying? This is how you have massive nationwide revival. is by getting rid of the us and them. I feel like the Lord would give us a strategy. I think it's quite simple, honestly. I don't think it's a complicated thing. But a strategy for for influencing nations. We say it a lot, talk about it a lot. We try it. We try it all the time. We pray, we sing, we preach, we evangelize, we go all over the world, and, and we will continue. But my concern in recent weeks is I've watched people that I love and care for to start thinking from another kingdom because they haven't picked up the fact that there are fiery darts coming at them through a castle, a fortress that was created with illegal thought. And you and I have permission to remove the habitation of the enemy where he has inhabited any lie that has caused us to continually live in a place of defeat and lack of fulfillment and purpose. God designed you to be a clear and power-filled representation of King Jesus. You were designed to represent him well. Why don't you stand Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. 
And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. He never meant for this to be complicated or to stress anyone. He just wants you to know, simple prayer for simple leaders shapes history. Don't forget the privileged assignment to pray for those that God has raised up over you. Because this truth is spreading all over the world. And we have some of the most hardcore people, political leaders, the most hardcore antichrist people that I know of in this country are becoming born again. And the Lord is doing it. The Lord is performing this. But that kind of thing cannot continue if we make it us and them. It's got to be because we say, you know what? We're all in this one together. Let's just love people well. Let's represent them well. Thanks for listening to the Sermon of the Week. Be sure to visit ibethel.tv for other exciting new content from Bethel Church.